Welcome to episode 221 of The Brainy Business, understanding the psychology of why people buy. In today's episode, I'm excited to welcome back my dear friend, Kwame Christian. Ready? Let's get started. You are listening to The Brainy Business Podcast, where we dig into the psychology of why people buy and help you incorporate behavioral economics into your business, making it more brain-friendly. Now here's your host, Melina Palmer. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Melina Palmer, and I want to welcome you to the Brainy Business Podcast. In today's conversation, I'm joined by Kwame Christian, who is, I believe, the first guest to be here on the show three times, though Dr. Marco Palma from the Human Behavior Lab at Texas A&M has technically been on the show three times, once was as part of a panel when we launched the certificate program. So I'm going to say that Kwame is in a class all his own for this and so many reasons. Kwame was also my first guest on the first ever live show of the Brainy Business, sort of behind the scenes on Fireside earlier this week. If you haven't heard of Fireside yet or checked out the show there, and if you don't yet have enough of Kwame, I know I never will, check out the show notes for this episode where you can watch the replay and subscribe and follow so that you can be part of the show uh, there on Fireside. Uh, that's all waiting for you at thebrainybusiness.com slash 221. So what is Fireside? Fireside is a new platform that was co-founded by Mark Cuban, where I was recently invited to do a show. It lets the audience come up on stage to participate and ask questions. It's all virtual, of course, over phones or uh, your computer. And it's really cool. I'm going to be testing it out for a bit to see if this is a good permanent addition to the content you get from the brainy business. So if you want it to stay around and you want a chance to come behind the scenes and be part of the show and be able to ask questions of me and of any guests that I might be bringing around please come join us there. Again, there are links in the show notes at thebrainybusiness.com slash 221. And when you download the Fireside app, you can search for me, Melina Palmer, or I believe just for the Brainy Business and find the show so you can join us for the next episode. All the freebies for the Brainy Business are housed within our free community of behavioral economics enthusiasts called the Be Thoughtful Revolution. When you go to those show notes and request your freebie, you'll be automatically added to the group and get access to all sorts of freebies. Plus, have a way to connect with me and others from around the world who love behavioral economics and want to share about it. Again, any freebie from the Brainy Business will get you into the group, including the one for this episode. You can also join the Be Thoughtful Revolution at any time using the link bit.ly forward slash join B-E-T-R. So what are we talking about today? Kwame's new book, How to Have Difficult Conversations About Race, which officially comes out next week on September 13th. We talked about that topic in more detail when he was on the show the first time back in 2020. So today we're going to dig in really specifically on the psychology aspects of his work and a specific chapter in the book, plus all sorts of other fun stuff. And yes, there are plenty of tips and practical advice for you. As I mentioned, Kwame has become a great friend, and I always love to chat with him and share his wisdom with the world. You are going to love hearing from him, so let's get right to it. Kwame Christian, welcome back to the Brainy Business Podcast. Hey, Melina. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We have... <laughs> so, you know, world will know, we Kwame and I have become good friends over the... Do you know what is crazy... Now, let me think. Oh, no, no. It's been two years. Okay. So we've been friends now for two years since you were first on the show. I was thinking I had a moment where I was like, oh my gosh, have we only known each other for a year? Because that can't be right. <laughs> but no, just too many things though have happened in these uh, two years where we've got books and we had kids at the same time over this last year and books coming out at the same time and podcast stuff and all the things going on. So it's been a busy two years, but um, this is Kwame's third time on the show, which is a unique thing. I don't have many, even just single repeat guests, let alone coming back a second time. But 
Kwame, of course, always love chatting with you and uh, glad when we can have an excuse to turn a conversation into a podcast episode, I guess. So for everyone who doesn't yet know you, can you share a little bit about your background and, and who you are? Yes. Well, thanks again for having me on the show again. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so my name is Kwame Christian. I'm the founder and CEO of the American Negotiation Institute, where we conduct negotiation and conflict resolution trainings that make your difficult conversations easier. Um, I have two books now. Um, Finding Confidence in Conflict is number one. And number two, which is what we're going to talk about today, is how to have difficult conversations about race. And um also host of the number one negotiation podcast in the world, Negotiate Anything. And the reason we're Number one is because we have great guests like Melina coming on the show, which is what we're going to do tomorrow. Another multiple time guest on my podcast, too. So, uh, so yeah, this is just a, a podcaster love fest and, and you all are privy to our fun conversations. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I appreciate having someone that we're just on the same wavelength anyway, but going through similar things like book babies and human babies, right? There's a lot that happens in the same same time. So Kwame, you are, of course, an attorney and you do work in negotiation and you have a background in psychology, which is why it's not just that, you know, any and every attorney um, wouldn't be a, a fit for the show once, let alone three times. Uh, but because of your background in psychology uh, and knowing how you work that into um, to your work in negotiation and, and what it is that you teach in this understanding of the brain is really important. Uh, we'll link, of course, to the past two times you've been on the show where we talked about um, actually difficult conversations at work about race and inequality, which is the first time you were on the show. And then now that has become a book. So we won't fully revisit that here, even though we're talking about the new book. Uh, but can you share just, I guess, a little bit about that journey that got you to this book? So when you were on the show before, you had said you were actually kind of reluctant to be entering into the conversation and then sort of like dove in head first, I guess. <laughs> And, and book has come out of it. So what was that process like? Yeah, I, uh, I'm kind of like a reluctant thought leader in, in this space, really, um, because I, I didn't want to get pigeonholed in um, the like the diversity, equity and, and inclusion space. Not to say that there is it's not important. It is very important. Um, but just being honest, thinking about biases, it's really easy for um, a black professional to be pigeonholed in like, oh, this person is an expert in being black. It's like, well, that doesn't sound great. <laughs> you know, I for me, it's about <laughs> negotiation, conflict resolution, but psychology as the base. And I saw so many people having this conversation because it's it's important or trying to have the conversation or wanting to have the conversation, but they don't have the skills to actually have the conversation effectively. So for me, I want to be where the toughest conversations are. And in 2020, when I started this process, that was on the topic of race. And when I think about just America as a whole, like the trajectory we're on, there's a lot of division. There's a lot of conflict and not a lot of high level dialogue happening on those topics. So I want to provide a resource that could elevate the conversation and allow us to to use this as an opportunity to connect and make these conversations constructive rather than destructive. So one of the things I make a very, very clear early on in the book is that um, I'm not here to teach people how to think about race. I'm here to offer guidance on how to talk about race. And so that gives me a very narrow and unique niche within the industry, too. Yeah. And while it is about the, you know, the book itself, you're talking about race. Um, but I would assume that the uh, lessons within are applicable to other difficult conversations as well. Absolutely. I, let's, yes, this is great. I'm fellow, talking to a fellow nerd here. So you there when you think about the the Frank Sinatra bias too, or one of the more obscure ones where they think of, you think about his song New York, New York. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, right? And I want people to have that same mentality when it comes to the topic of difficult conversations about race, because regardless, we're talking about human interaction on on the topics of of, of something that's very very sensitive and emotional. If you understand how to have that conversation effectively, it'll make it a lot easier for you to have other conversations on sensitive topics effectively as well. So as people are reading the book and, and learning how to have the conversation, I want you to 
to always keep in mind the ubiquitous nature of the, the psychological principles and the conversational strategies too. Because you could use this in a conversation with your family about dinner time, who's who's buying, who's cooking, whatever it happens to be. Um, you can use it in sales and negotiation conversations. And of course, you can use it in conversations about equally sensitive topics. Yeah. And so I know that um, I had the opportunity to read a ch- uh, an early chapter that is the one that is all about the psychology stuff, right? So uh, being able to see... Uh, different biases and items that you think really tie in with these difficult conversations. Um, what, what are some of the top ones for you? And knowing this isn't your typical conversation you get to have in uh, interviews about the book, um, what are some of the ones that you think are most relevant and important to keep in mind when you are having difficult conversations with people? I think... And, and this th- this point that I'm going to make, admittedly, will sound very basic at first, but it will evolve. So stay with me. I, I think it's about understanding and appreciating and accepting the ubiquitous nature of bias. We we are all biased in different types of ways. And I want us to think more broadly about bias. That's one of my challenges or frustrations is that we always think about biases as it applies to protected classes of citizens. Um, but bias is just the way that we think in general. Right. And so. I want people to not, I want people to have a more empowered stance when it comes to bias, because a lot of times we allow it to turn into a self-fulfilling prophecy. This person is different from me. We have different lived experiences. We cannot connect. But for me, instead, I think about bias as a strategic consideration. I think I take an educated guess, create a like a, a hypothesis. What are the potential biases that might be in play in this conversation? And then I'll create a conversational strategy around it. And the way that I think about it, and this is this is where it gets unique, is that when I think about these difficult conversations, my strategy is to identify the potential biases that might get in the way and use a conversational strategy that minimizes the negative impact of those biases, while at the same time asking myself, what biases can I leverage in my favor? And that's where it becomes different because people always say bias is bad. Of course, people like alliteration. B and B, it sounds really it's smooth, right? Yep. <laughs> fluency, cognitive fluency. But the reality is bias is real and bias is going to play a role. So why don't we take the time to calibrate and manage it's the role of bias in our favor? And that's where people don't think about it. They always think about it as a bad thing, but I think about it as a strategic tool that we can leverage for our advantage. Yep. In uh, in my new book, What Your Employees Need and Can't Tell You, I have a just, a, you know, you in book writing stuff, right? And like, sometimes you say something on a podcast or whatever, and you're like, oh, that was smart. And then you kind of forget about it, right? But when you're writing things for the book, you like sit with it a lot and you're like coming up with the perfect way to say something. And then sometimes you look back and you're like, man, I love that little line, right? And so I have the, it's a silly thing now and I've built it up way too much that this is not that great of a line. But like I have, a, I was just having to read through it last week and do all the new edits and stuff for the final edit. And it was the, the just that we have a bias about biases, right? So like, the, like I said, this is not that good of a line, y'all. I'm sorry I like built that way, way up into being something really amazing. But that's, we we definitely want people think that the goal is to be unbiased. We want an unbiased organization. We're going to get rid of bias, but that's, like you said, that's how our brains make decisions. We That is an unachievable goal. So, and instead, like you said, leveraging those biases by understanding how they work, how to navigate through the, the ones when you need to, how to work with them, you know, is definitely a better strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that line, by the way. You built Thanks. it up appropriately. It matched <laughs> the level of anticipation. It's, it's great. And you're, you're absolutely right. And, um, the, I think we're, we're biased against bias and we're biased against bias training too, because it's been done improperly in the majority of cases. And st- looking at the studies, it, it actually has a negative impact when done mm. improperly a mm-hmm. lot of times too, because it focuses so much on the negative that people say, you know what? There are a lot of ways that I can fail. I didn't even think about that. So I'm just not going to engage with people at all. And so right. that's yeah. something that really inhibits the conversation because people see the risk, but they don't see the reward. So they don't engage. Um, and, and that's challenging. 
but I, I was just in a, a presentation a little bit ago. I was telling you about this and we talked about bias. Of course, you can't not talk about bias. And I asked them, I was like, do you know how to, to get rid of biases? There's one way to get rid of biases. And they looked at me confused. I was like, it's really simple. Actually, you, you turn off your brain. And that's also known as death. It seems like an extreme yeah. <laughs> type of solution. So let's live with the fact that we have biases and learn to manage it because yeah. the alternative is, is just not not tenable. <laughs> right. It's not. Yeah. Be And it's not even that you just don't be around anybody else because we're, you know, biasing all day, every day. And so uh, even with our own decisions, even if you're alone by yourself, cut off from the world, <laughs> the biases are still running the the life that you have, like you said. Um, well, I'm actually, I know you do a lot of bias training for, for corporations of all kinds. What sort of stuff goes into that? We haven't actually talked about this much before. And I've seen uh, you, I feel like you're always on my LinkedIn. Well, you're always on my LinkedIn anyway, and I love that and my Instagram, uh, but that you have like you're some new place talking to some awesome company. I feel like, did you do a talk at NASA? I did. I did. See, I it mean, was, it was out cool. of this world. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> 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 yeah. Dad jokes. Watch out. All day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's been really fun. And again, I, I used to do bias trainings in the way that the, the studies now warn against. <laughs> but what's so, so ironic is that there is such a bias in, in the, in the industry of people who do bias trainings, there's such a bias in favor of doing bias trainings in the way they've always been done that yeah. they, the confirmation bias doesn't allow them to realize that, Hey, the way we've been doing bias trainings doesn't work. Science is telling us, right? The same, you know, like, come on now. Why do we respect some science and not others? Oh, that's right. Bias again. Right. right? And <laughs> yeah. so for me, I focus on connection. How can we under, turn this understanding as an in, into an opportunity to connect. And there's one section of my book that's called "You're Not Making Enough Mistakes." And I know I'm I'm not giving people the license to be reckless and go around offending people. Of course not. But if we're not making any mistakes, that might be an indication of us not interacting with people who see the world differently than us. Right. And so this is really important for us to understand the risks of the conversations, but also understand the rewards of having the conversations. And then you can devise a strategy to navigate the conversation in a way that minimizes risk. But you have to understand what the risks are first. And so I always want to have a hopeful tone when it comes to the bias trainings that we do and approach it in terms of skills. So what are the skills that I need? in order to navigate this conversation effectively, to not trip over these biases in a way that then hurts people unnecessarily or damages our ability to be effective. And so, again, it just goes back to one of the things I always say in the book is we have to be outcome oriented in the conversation. What is my goal? What do I want to accomplish? And then I need to reverse engineer a strategy for that goal. And a big part of that strategy is being an aware of the biases that might be in play. And then, like I said before, making sure that we navigate through in a way that minimizes resistance, but also we can think about the biases that could work for us in this conversation and be mindful about how to trigger those in our favor in the conversation too. Yeah. And I definitely want to come back to that. I, I'm curious though. So you mentioned a couple of times that the you know science shows that the old way of doing the bias training is, we'll say, wrong slash bad slash causing problems. <laughs> Right. Can you expand a little bit on that, though? So for everyone listening, potentially is this question of like, well, what am I doing wrong? What should I be avoiding? In addition to, of course, hiring Kwame to come in and do some really good bias training for your team. What should we be looking out for that's causing some of the problem? Is there anything specific there? Yeah, let me let me talk very broadly and then get a bit more specific. So when speaking broadly, essentially what people leave with in a lot of these trainings about bias is that they see the world differently. They say, wow, you're racist. I'm racist. Everybody's racist. I'm offending people all the time and I don't know it. This is terrifying, <laughs> right? And so they leave afraid and they're walking on eggshells for the, the duration of their professional career. So when you think about issues of inclusion and belonging, you, you now we've made people more afraid of interacting with people who are demographically different, which is antithetical to our inclusion goals. 
right? And so for me, what I my my shift on this is again just letting people know about the science in in not a doom and gloom type of way, but again recognizing, like you said so articulately, there is a bias against biases. We have to recognize that we need to be aware of the biases, but not fear them. We need to have a healthy respect for them. These biases are real. They will have an impact. And just recognizing that um, I I have a slide that that this is all it says. Biases don't make us bad. Biases make us human. And just recognize that biases, whether we like them or, or hate them, the reality is they exist. And they're one of those things that bring us together as humans because we all struggle with bias in, in different ways. So I want people to think a little bit more critically about their thoughts, a bit more metacognition, and then they can interact with people at a, at a higher level while understanding the way that biases might play a role in those interactions. Yeah, definitely. I'm all about thinking about thinking feel like metacognition is a fan- much fancier way of saying that. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. But uh, it's like the inception of the brain, right? But well, I was thinking when you were talking before too, so um, on changing minds, do I remember I have had a bunch of books come my way recently that I've been privileged enough to be able to read in advance of books coming out, which I enjoy a lot. And I've been doing a bunch of interviews. So I've been reading a lot of books. And I can't remember because I know there were a couple different books that talked about something along this line. So I've been reading a lot of stuff about change right now. Did your the chapter you sent me, I think had something to do with uh, someone who be befri- uh, uh, a black man who bef- was befriending KKK members was that that was in yes okay because i know david mcraney uh, which i recommended david mcraney and how minds change after i interviewed him i texted kwame which i do a lot it's like i interviewed this person i think you they might be a good guest if you're interested let me know and i'll make a connection and this one i said like i'm not even asking you david's coming on your show (laughs) like i am making this connection you need to need to need to talk to him uh i'll of course link to the episode when david was on the show but he talked about something sort of similar in his book but can you share a little bit about where we say my goodness it's this insurmountable obstacle right like how am i supposed to get my boss who's a jerk or this person who's not like me what is what am i supposed to do how could i possibly change them and i think you know um david talks about the you know the father-in-law or the person at the family get together who is just like you're always arguing with cuz you're on opposite sides of the political spectrum or whatever it is and uh so finding this like getting uncomfortable making some mistakes and this is like very high stakes <laughs> possible mistakes but can you tell a little bit about that that story and how that ties into um you know helping people to see the opportunity in those conversations. Yeah, it's it's a really great story about a man named Daryl Davis. And this is a true story. And he would, like, what he would do is he would try to convert KKK members, which is, I mean, good for him. <laughs> and so he has, um, according to him, has converted over 200 people um from that were former KKK members to renounce their their allegiance with the the clan and so one of his good friends now is um I believe his name was Robert Kelly former grand wizard of the KKK so like the lead KKK person and now they're legit friends and and uh, he's actually the godfather I believe of of one of his children or something like that it's insane like they're they've they've essentially gone from friends to family it's wild and so one of the things that I talk about specifically there is that I want to make people aware of the fact that you're more persuasive than you think. They're like somebody who's in the KKK. We say they're way too far gone, way too far gone. But this is a guy who has an incredibly high success rate when, when it comes to those types of conversations where it's literally their identity as a racist. (laughs) Like I am a proud racist. Okay. Wow. So we're changing that. That's, that's, that's significant, right? So that's one reason I put it in there. The other reason is that we also have uh, biases within ourselves that operate as self-fulfilling prophecies. And so we say, I cannot connect with this person. This person is so bigoted, so biased against me that there's no way I can get through. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if I bring that mindset, that energy, that um, 
that perception into the conversation. Even if I try, it's going to impact the way that I engage with the other person. And the person's going to say, so in, in my mind, if I'm saying this person's racist, I'm too different. They're not going to connect there. Then I go and have the conversation essentially half-heartedly. They're like, I don't know what's up with that, that Kwame guy. I was here to listen. And he just it didn't seem like he really cared to have the conversation. And then it'd be, what happens? I'm not persuasive. And then I say, you see, it's because he's racist. Or maybe it's because I'm a little bit racist. What was it really? Right. So I, I introduce a, a concept called um, helpful fictions. And so this is a these are essentially lies <laughs> that I tell myself to counter biases that I believe I might have. So the helpful fiction I brought up in that example is the belief that I can connect and persuade anybody. I can connect with and persuade anybody. Is that true? No, it's not. But believing that changes the way I interact with people in the conversation. So it's, it was a really interesting um, exploration into that story because again, we we have more persuasive power than we realize. Yeah. And the it's an interesting, that particular helpful fiction, I would say, so if you were to say I can influence and persuade or change the mind of anyone is what you said. Like, I think that is true. It may not feel like it in the moment. And you'd have to put in a lot of effort to make that happen. If you said everyone would say, okay, no, because like everyone <laughs> you don't have enough time in the day that because this isn't just an easy the thing is we're always looking for the the silver bullet the easy thing more biases here right of our brains wanting we say we want to put in the work and then we're googling like go viral with no effort right <laughs> <laughs> three and then you can say i tried instagram and I put a post once and I didn't go viral. Instagram doesn't work anymore. That's not a thing. Nobody could go viral on Instagram, TikTok, whatever, right? And it's the same. I tried to talk with him. I had that conversation and he did not change his mind just like I knew that he would not, right? In the way that we are approaching it. It's like, so you had one conversation where you sort of tried one time going in with the intent to win and convince them that they were wrong and that didn't work. So it's a lost cause. Like, really? Like, that's how we feel about it. But you know, that's, I mean, that's what our brains do all the time. Right. But you have to put in the effort to make it work. So all I was saying is in that helpful fiction, I think it is a true thing in that way. You really could influence anyone and get them to change their mind likely, but it would potentially be a lot, 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 lot of effort and more than you need to in that particular aspect, as is showcased by the example of the guy who's now besties with the former, is it really Grand Wizard? Is that the official? Literally the title. I would not make that one up. <laughs> 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 I know yes. I've heard that and um like, well, all right. Mm -hmm. So the, the <laughs> Grand Wizard. Yeah. It's like, come on, peeps. If you want to be taken seriously as a racist organization, you need to come up with more legitimate names. Yeah. But maybe that's my bias. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> so tying this back though, so if so I think that helps to say, yes, there is hope, but it's not in the, like I was saying, you're not going in and trying to win. So if uh, the the man, what's the name of the, the guy that was befriending the people? Daryl Davis. Daryl. So if Daryl was to go in and say, I'm going to storm into that meeting and I'm going to show them like, Ew, that is a bad, bad decision. And he actually, though, he had gotten an invitation without explaining the color of his skin and they said yes please come to the meeting and he because he said he was curious about their beliefs and and whatnot they invited him in he shows up and they go oh <laughs> <laughs> now we're kind of <laughs> cognitive dissonance maybe uh, coming into play there but he truly was curious in the questions that he was asking you know why do we feel this way tell me more and having this open interested approach. And I think the question being like, how can you hate me when you've never met me sort of a space allowed him to get to, to change someone's mind and entire life. So uh, what insights are there then for someone if they're looking at work, you know, bringing it back. So 
a boss, a coworker, and what, I don't know if the book specifically, if you're looking at getting initiatives put in place or just opening minds, is it all, I would assume it's all types of uh, conversations and opportunities. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. And so one of the things I talk about is that the the book can be used by anybody who has any goal in these conversations. If your goal is to persuade people, we have that in the book. If your goal is to just escape these conversations with minimal damage, we have that in the book too, right? And so we have a whole um, section or chapter dedicated towards advocacy and change management at work. So how to have these difficult conversations as an ally or an advocate trying to create positive change in the workplace. And um, that's where it gets a little bit more tactical. That's where we bring in some more of those negotiation techniques. But again, I, li- I like building off of the story about Daryl Davis because we might have people at our organization who are resistant. We might have people who are racist, but most likely you don't have a KKK member, right? <laughs> so <laughs> most, I really hope fingers not. crossed, fingers <laughs> yes. crossed. Yeah. And so uh, the, I wanted to make people aware that it's, it's doable, right? But I think the, the tactics somewhat shift when you're actually trying to accomplish something. Because again, I say it all the time. I want you all to be outcome oriented in these conversations. So what, what is the outcome? Now, if we're trying to actually create positive change, then we have to, to, to approach it somewhat different, differently. And so when we think about change again, I think we have to change our mind, mentality as well because we have the status quo bias. This, the way that things are, we assume that's the way that things should be or have always been. Um, and there's some legitimacy to that. But a lot of times, whenever we are having, when we're looking at the structures within an organization, especially if the organization has some level of longevity, the rules of interaction were negotiated at the time where most likely women and people of color did not have a seat at the table. And so one of the things that I, I want people to do is have a different perspective on what is negotiable. Anything that does not violate a physical law is negotiable. And so, again, that's why the podcast is called Negotiate Anything, because you can and should negotiate everything. And um, I think really it starts a lot with the mindset. You have to determine what change needs to happen and recognize that you can change anything. And look at the pandemic. There are people who said, oh, we'll never do remote work. One week, remote work. Right. <laughs> right? So yeah. we can do it. We can do it. We just have to have the right mindset. Yeah, for sure. And I don't remember if this is something that you've said when you've been a guest on the show or um, when you've done some guest lectures for some of my classes at Texas A&M. Uh, I know you've said it there because I brought it up, but I don't remember if it originated on a podcast episode. But I know I really appreciate that you talk about the any opportunity or any conversation has the opportunity to give someone the gift of a negotiation is, is I think, paraphrased. I don't think I said that quite the way that you do. And I think for most people, we think of negotiations as this hostile attack, right? Like me against you and someone's going to win. Uh, but looking at it as, you know, this reframe is really powerful. Can you share a little bit about that as we close out our conversation? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think the, the conversation we're having right now is a great example of what a great negotiation should sound like. So Melina is leading the dance. She is the leader of the conversation. I'm following her lead, but I don't feel controlled by the way that she's approaching the conversation. She's leading with curiosity, asking a lot of open-ended questions, giving me space to speak and allowing me to speak more than her, right? This is what a negotiation should feel like. This is what it should look like right? We're generous conversationalists that are curious. And I think that's one of the reasons why Daryl was so successful. He wasn't in there to change minds. He just wanted to understand. And one of the things that you realize is that persistence is persuasive and just asking questions and giving people the respect of listening by itself can be (laughs) persuasive too. So I think the, the reality is that conflict is an opportunity. These difficult conversations provide us with opportunities. And if we think about it through that opportunity framework, it helps us to realize that there is value in leaning in and having the conversations. And we don't need to be uh, manipulative. We don't need to be Machiavellian or incredible orators to, to be successful in these conversations. You just need to be curious and listen. That's really it. Yeah, I know that. And that's, you know, put the 
close your computer, have it be on a like fully black screen or whatever it is, have the notifications off, really just be in the moment. That's one thing my husband had said, um, you know, we, we knew each other before we started dating or anything that we were friends that worked together at different organizations. But he was saying like, it's an interesting thing in having a conversation with me saying it's different because he's like, you really, you're looking at people when you talk to them in a way that most people don't do these days, right? That I'm actually engaging with the person that I'm talking to and looking at them in a way that I guess is not normal, which is sad. Let's make that the norm now. Let's really focus on the thing we're doing in the moment we're doing it for sure. Uh, Well, thank you so much, Kwame. I have talked to you all day. We spent too much time catching up uh, that we, we, we only had our, you know, 30 ish minutes to have our conversation here on the air. But um, I always enjoy talking with you for everyone who's ready to go get their copy of your new book, which just came out this week, as far as when this episode's coming out, you know, where should they do that? What's best place to connect with you and to learn more? Perfect. So yes, the book, um, I'll, I'll give you some links, but anywhere books are sold, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, all, Target, all those places. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always posting semi-interesting things. <laughs> I try to post every day. And um, then also, yeah, if you're interested in a negotiation or conflict resolution workshop, check out the American Negotiation Institute.com. Perfect. We will absolutely have links to those in the show notes. And I, you know, have can highly, highly vouch for Kwame and his awesomeness. He's worth having conversations with all the time and your organization definitely should. So thanks again, Kwame, for joining me on the show. It was fun to chat with you as always. Thanks for having me, my friend. Appreciate it. Thank you again to Kwame Christian for joining me on the show today. What got your brain buzzing in today's conversation? For me, I love the idea that no one is too far gone to have their mind changed or to make progress, but you need to look at your own approach and give something before you can get something. Genuine curiosity and kindness can go so far, and even someone who you think is a totally immovable object doesn't have to be. Now, it's also important to remember that not everyone and not every situation is worth that effort. I'm also a big fan of the phrase, not my circus, not my monkeys, because there's a lot that doesn't need to be my job or my stress or my problem. If I allowed myself to get all caught up in everyone's drama, I would never get anything done. Prioritizing what matters for me and choosing my battles is so important in having an impact, and I recommend that for you as well. Not every battle is yours to fight. Choose where you can have or want to have impact and go full force one strategic decision at a time. And the items that aren't part of that path for you, you can just bless and release. I like to say Elsa it, which means, you know, you can let it go, be okay and move forward knowing that you are having more impact when you're focused on something than if you're spread too thin around a lot of different aspects. And remember, going to battle doesn't mean you're going to be harsh or aggressive or forceful with everyone or anyone for that matter, Kwame's framework is called compassionate curiosity for a reason. Be genuinely curious and open to learning something as you interact with people instead of going in trying to win every argument, and you'll be amazed at the progress you can make. And of course, get your copy of Kwame's new book, How to Have Difficult Conversations About Race, which can help you in so many conversations in life, business, and everywhere in between. You'll find a link to that, as well as other related books, past episodes, including our recent live episode on Fireside, as well as ways to connect with Kwame. It's all waiting for you in the show notes, which are within the app you're listening to and at thebrainybusiness.com slash 221. And thank you again to Kwame Christian for joining me on the show today. It was a delight to chat with and learn from you. Join me next week to learn from Phil Agnew, host of the Nudge podcast, for some fascinating and practical tips for applying behavioral economics in your social media. It's going to be a lot of fun. You won't want to miss it. Until then, thanks again for listening and learning with me. And remember to be thoughtful. Thank you for listening to the Brainy Business Podcast. 
Melina offers virtual strategy sessions, workshops, and other services to help businesses be more brain-friendly. For more free resources, visit thebrainybusiness.com.